بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا المرسلين الخاتم النبيين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد uh, First of all, الحمد لله Thank you very much for having me today السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I am very honored to be here uh, It's my first time in Sheffield I've been coming to the UK for a very long time However, this is my first time here, so I'm very happy to be here. Very honored that you would take time out of your schedules uh, to come and listen to uh, me try and say a few words uh, that will not be adequate enough to cover the subject of Malcolm X. But uh, thank you again. I really do appreciate it. And uh, please forgive me. I have to wear the jumper. It's cold to me. Uh, I wasn't prepared for the weather um, I, for the past two and a half years. Uh, I've been living in the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, uh, doing Darwin, and developing the community there. And I'm used to very hot weather. So coming here was a little, you know, I was a little surprised. I forgot that it is cold at this time of the year. So alhamdulillah. Um, inshallah. Do I really need that? Can you, can you hear me? You can hear me? I'm sorry, I just don't like standing behind podiums because it's so impersonal. You know, this is, I'm not here to, to talk at you. Or I'm here to talk to you, share some things. And so I chose not to stand behind there because I'm not a professor. I'm, I'm actually an usted. If you have to give me a title, which is a teacher, I'm not a sheikh. I don't, that, this is a sheikh. You can tell by the way he recites, you can tell by his mannerisms, you can tell by his, the dignity that he has the, you know, in his posture and the way he commands uh, respect just in his person. I'm not that guy. So prefer, I prefer, you know, Ustad Jamal. But uh, inshallah ta'ala, we want to uh, take a look at X. All right, how many of you have seen this movie since this is our thing today? How is... How many of you seen it? Okay, a few of you. Okay, how many people, how many in the room do not even know who Malcolm X is? Please raise your hand. Okay, so we all know a little, okay, a little bit about who he is, if nothing at all. A few people. But anyways, Malcolm X, right? This is a man who grew up in a time in the United States of America, which was not very far away and still we have remnants of it today, in which white America sought very hard to oppress black Americans. Right? And in this time period, his father was a person who was part of movement, part of an intellectual revolution to open up the minds of black people in the United States. In fact, his movement was for all black people to leave the United States and go back to Africa. But white America wouldn't have that. I mean, we got to have somebody put a foot on. And we can't have black people thinking they're equals. His mother was a very dark, or sorry, his father was a very dark man. His mother was from uh, the Caribbean islands. She was very light, very fair woman. But nonetheless, they dealt with a lot of atrocities in the United States based upon their color and the fact they weren't white Americans. In fact, as Malcolm X was growing up, and you find a lot of times in the school systems in the United States, even to this day, there is a plot to make sure that black students do not excel. In fact, I live in Atlanta, Georgia right now, and in Atlanta, Georgia, in Gwinnett County, it was discovered they actually set up, a, they had a system in the schools in which they were making sure that the white students got all the resources and were getting taught differently than the black students and the Latino students. But the Latinos, they kind of pushed a little bit more because most Latinos are, are, are starting to vote Republican. So now they're becoming more conservative. We've got to help them out a little bit, not much, but a little bit just to, you know, to let them feel like they're part of the process and they're being accepted. But we're leaving the African-American or the black American in a situation where they're going to struggle. May a, a few might make it through the cracks. 
but we're trying to set up the system so these people cannot be successful academically. And this is true. You can look it up. It was found. Gwinnett County. So now, we're looking back in this time where it was more prevalent, where people were getting called nigga left and right, right and left, and people were being mistreated. Blacks were still getting hung. They were getting beaten in the streets. And Malcolm X goes to school, and he was a very, very intelligent young man. But his teacher told him when he said he wanted to be something very high, told him, oh, no, you can be a shoe shiner. You know, you can be the janitor. You can be someone who, who builds houses. Yeah, that's something you can do. But you're talking about becoming a professional? Oh, no, no, no. Can't have that. Because black professionals start getting more vocal and demanding rights and, de and demanding civil rights and demanding a bigger piece of the pie. We can't have that because America is for white America. And again, you still see the remnants of that today. So Malcolm X leaves the Michigan is where he was born. And then he moves over to the East Coast. He goes to the big city. Things are happening. Right. They didn't have rap music, they had bebop. And when they had the bebop, you know, they used to wear zoot suits. Now, at least they wore suits. They weren't sagging and things like that. They still looked nice. A zoot suit is a big baggy pair of pants and a coat that came down to just below your knees. And you wore a great big hat. And you had a, you know, a different type of swag. Right, because you had to walk with your hand like this as you walk down the street. That was the that was the walk, the pimp walk back then. I don't know what you're doing today. <laughs> you know, I see a lot of different things. But I don't know what's correct and what's not. Like I said, I've been on the island for a while, and they have a whole other thing going on. <laughs> but this is how he was living. He came from small town to big city, the big lights, big life going to dancing, thank you, uh, going out to the clubs, drinking, doing drugs. And because he didn't have uh, uh, any education, because he chose the street life instead of a more dignified life in terms of getting educated and really trying to make more of himself, what did he do? He went to the streets to make that what? That quick money. This is where it was happening. This is where everything was going on. He knew the women liked what? The dangerous guys. The bad boys, right? The ones that seem to rebel against society and the norm. And so then he goes into a situation in which he starts robbing to make the quick money. And then he gets caught and sent to prison. And even in prison, he starts living a life of a, of a maniac to the point where they had to call him Satan. He was that crazy. And in America, prisons are much different than they are in this country. I mean, literally, your life is on the line. Your manhood is on the line. Because there's always someone looking to take both. You know, back then, and even in the 80s, you had guys who used to, like, put this chemical in their hair to make it nice and straight. Because you wanted to have straight hair. We had this thing called good hair and bad hair. So if your hair was a little, you know, extra curled up, that was bad hair. If your hair looked like a white person's hair or it was least straight, that's considered good hair. And then sometimes you get a little mix in between. So everybody were taught, people were taught to have what? Good hair because that's better. And so he was getting this even in prison. And then while he was in prison, unlike the movie, the real story, his brother and sister came to him because they had joined this thing called the Nation of Islam. And in this Nation of Islam, they met this man called Elijah Muhammad. And Elijah Muhammad, at that time, amongst the black people, was considered a prophet. A prophet of Islam. 
And God had come and put in a personified form of man named Farad Muhammad, who, by the way, was a Pakistani guy, who came and said he was Allah, and that he had chosen Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Poole was his original name, but told him, your name should be like Muhammad because you are a messenger. So he became Elijah Muhammad. And there was another guy he taught, but he kind of fell off. He didn't really believe, he wasn't buying what was being sold. But Elijah Muhammad took it and began to go to the black people of the United States and say that you are the children of God. You are the promised children of God, not the Jewish people. You, the black man, have suffered throughout the world, throughout the history of time. Anybody dark understands what I'm talking about. I don't care what country you come from, whether it be India, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, darker skinned people are treated much differently. So he's saying that they equate this to say that even the Asiatic brothers, meaning sub, uh, the subcontinent as well as people from uh, Southeast Asia, are still considered a, a, a part of the black community. Whether they wish to acknowledge it or not, from their perspective, you're still considered part of the black community because you're not white. And as a result of that, you belong with us. So therefore, the black man has taken it for thousands of years. And now he's looking at the blacks in America and he's saying, you have got to open up your eyes to understand the truth of who you really are. You're not these pimps. You're not a pusher. The women are not prostitutes. You're not bred to be prostitutes. You're not supposed to be out here just selling yourself short. You're supposed to be people of dignity. People of pride. Astute people. And this is what he helped them to understand. And when Malcolm X first started hearing this kind of stuff, again, a man from the street, it, that's not, he wants to know where the hustle is. I mean, well, how are you making your money? There's got to be some catch to this because this doesn't sound right. And for a black man to be speaking with good English even sound even worse. In America, we have this thing called dumbing yourself down where a lot of black students, a lot of Latino students, a lot of students who come from the ghettos, when they go to school, if they speak with correct English or they're very smart, the other kids who don't speak very good English, who aren't very, studi or are very uh, studious, will start calling you white boy. They'll look at you and say, look at that white boy. Oh, you're trying to be white, trying to talk like that. I was one of them. I didn't say dough and flow and mo. I said door, for, and more. I don't say sister, I say sister. I pronounce my R's. But because of that, I was called white boy. I was mistreated at school. Because I got good grades, I was treated very poorly. Instead of people saying, hey, can I study with you? People were pounding on me. I had a rough life. Because I lived in a predominantly white neighborhood, but I was going to predominantly black schools. And I'm too black to hang out with all the white kids, but I'm too white acting for the black kids. So I've got nowhere to go. What do I do? My friends became international. I started hanging out with immigrant kids. In fact, my best friend was from Venezuela. My second best friend was from Malaysia. My other friend was Israeli. And we enjoyed ourselves. I was considered a nerd, an outcast. I didn't care. I was happy until all of them moved back to their countries and left me by myself. Different type of situation. Anyways, so as Malcolm X begins to grow, he begins to start understanding and accepting the information that was coming the knowledge and the things that he hadn't heard and his eyes and heart had become open to this thing called Islam or what he understood Islam to be at that point in time in his life. He began to want to read because Islam, as, as he understood it, was calling us to education. 
It was calling us to education. And so he understood that, oh, I can't just call myself a, uh, or be, become, become perfect without being educated, without understanding some things. And he went on and memorized basically every word in the dictionary. You know, when you're in prison, you have a lot of time on your hands. So you're either lifting weights or you're reading a book. Sometimes both. In his case, he chose the book. And he read the dictionary and he spent all his time with the dictionary to the point where he couldn't see because he was in the cell using the light from the, from the ceiling. Because he couldn't use the light in his room at night until he memorized every word in the dictionary. And then he began reading the Bible. But he read the Bible with a new fervor, with a different perspective. And when he began to challenge the, the pastors, and then he began challenging the educators in the prisons, it became a problem. His eyes had become open. His heart had become open. And he began a new pursuit of truth. He, was, he began a journey for Haq. And for El Haq. And as he got out of prison, they moved him immediately to become one of the ministers. And the man was out on the corners talking to the people, speaking to the people, trying to do what? Open their eyes to remove the veil. Allah does tell us in the Quran about those people that are what? Deaf, dumb, and blind. Because a veil has been placed upon their hearts and they cannot see truth when truth has been placed right before them. And so he spent time talking to the people. He spent time reaching out to the people. Look at yourselves. Look at yourselves. We were just looking at a speech of Malcolm X just the other night or this morning. And he was telling the people, wait a minute, you hate yourselves. You hate yourselves. But who taught you to hate yourself? You hate your hair, you want to straighten it out. And in today's time, we're getting weaves and extensions. You hate yourself. You want to put on makeup and cover up what you have. And you're naturally beautiful. But yet you feel a need. Brothers getting new funky haircuts not to express themselves, but to be different, to stand out, and to get the attention from the sisters. You can't tell me I'm wrong. We're changing the way we express ourselves because society has made us feel that we have to look a certain way and act a certain kind of way. And that's what, exactly what happened within the black community. Just recently, just recently, I don't know if you saw on CNN, they did a test with some kids, some black kids, and they laid two dolls in front of them, a white doll and a black doll. They asked, which doll is ugly? The black one. Which doll is beautiful? The white one. Which doll is nice? The white one. Which doll is evil? The black one. Now, why do you think that? There's a reason in Hollywood, every time the world is in jeopardy, there's always a white guy saving the world. I don't have a problem if it's a Chinese dude. I don't have a problem if it's a Latino guy saving the world. Come on, they save the world too sometimes. Right? It doesn't have to be a black guy. And if it's a woman, it's usually a blonde-haired, blue-eyed lady with some type of figure. Tell me I'm wrong. But we've gotten to the point where it's not a problem. We accept it. I was with one guy and we were talking about this movie Equalizer with Denzel Washington and the guy was like, oh man, I don't know if I can believe this. I just, you know, see, I said, well, hey, if Bruce Willis can do it, why can't Denzel? You got no problem if it was Bruce Willis as old as he is doing a movie like this today, so why do we have a, why do we have a problem with Denzel? Or Wesley Snipes? You understand what I'm saying? We've been conditioned to accept a certain group of things, a certain perspective. We watch Avatar, even though the guy was blue, he really was a white guy. 
saving the tribes of people. The woe, the lowly people can't seem to rally themselves up and, and unite themselves. You know, Mr. White Guy comes in, yeah, we're going to save them. Give them a great powerful speech, right? That brave heart speech. And the tribes are ready to unite and save the, save the planet. There's a reason for that. I'm not saying that we can't, you know, enjoy, you know, white heroes. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that there is a conditioning that we have, that we're undergoing. And this is what we see. And this is what is highlighted. Right. Only now are we starting to see a little bit of change because there's been a lot of comments such as my own right now that have been made about these things. And we're starting to see things and and the greater powers that be are starting to become more accepting of these things. So times are changing, but slowly, but the but the root and the base is still there. And so now. Malcolm X is out in the streets and he's calling people and opening their eyes and helping them to, to better themselves. Offering a 12-step program to get people off of drugs, take women off of prostitution, helping them to clean themselves up, to dignify themselves. Getting people off of drugs and alcohol. Because the government is not trying to do that. The government has no interest and trying to get people off of drugs. They need you on drugs. They need you drunk because you're easy to control. They need you in a state where you, are, where you, where you can't think. They want you in a state where you can't articulate what's happening in your situation and that you cannot and will not see a way out. And anytime you try to blame it on them and say, well, look, I'm not the one taking the drugs. I'm not putting drugs in you. You choose that. You chose to go to the liquor store. You chose to go to the local grocery store and buy alcohol. You chose to do this. It's not my fault. You don't you can't stop the consumption. Have any of you ever watched House of Cards on Netflix? It's a political show about a senator who's on his way trying to trying to basically finagle his way to the presidency. And in it, there's a, there's a senator who, who he uses as a pawn to get what he wants. And this senator loves drinking, he's an alcoholic, and he loves prostitutes. And so what he does is he uses his vices against him in order to get what he wants. And in one episode, he was like, we're going to back you up. We're going to help you run for governor of Philadelphia, and you're going to do all these wonderful things. And he was fine so long as he stayed in line. But when he started saying he became powerful, when he got to the point where he started saying, like, look, I'm seeing what's going on. I'm seeing what you're trying to do. And guess what? I'm not playing games anymore. I'm not playing ball with you. Now, I'm demanding some things. You're not in control any longer. I'm in control. This is what happens when one becomes clean, when one gets rid of the, the, the muck that's inside of the heart. When you remove yourself from the vices of this dunya, you begin to become clear, clear about what's going on around you. Your mind is in a state of complete clarity and you're able to decipher what is right and what is wrong, what is bad, what is good and what's going to be important in this life for the hereafter. And it was because of this and that loss of control by this other senator, he decided, okay, well, we got to put him back in place. So what he did was he set it up for him to meet a prostitute and get drunk. And he played on the vices. And you're watching and you're like, come on, man, don't drink. Don't take the bottle. No, please, no. And what did he do? Whoop. Got him. Got him. He drinks, he's with this prostitute, and the next thing you know, the guy had an interview and messed up the interview because he was drunk and because he was so embarrassed and his children saw it and he was embarrassed in front of his children. He tried to kill himself. He wanted to kill himself. The senator wound up killing him anyway. But this is the point. 
If we continuously follow this way of the dunya, this is going to be our end. We die. In what type of state? In a drunken, non-cognitive state, meaning we are not able to open up our minds and hearts to the reality of this life and be able to understand the, you know, what is important and what's not important and standing up for what is right and rejecting and speaking against what is wrong. And again, here's Malcolm X trying to do this type of work. But the thing is, the twist on his thing is, is that the white man is the one who's controlling the system. Therefore, the white man is conducting devilish type acts. Because in the Quran, we're taught how Iblis said he was going to be waiting on mankind on his left, his right and front and back of him to deceive him and take him off the right path. So in his mind, these are devilish acts. And because they're devilish acts, then the white man has to be the devil. So therefore, in the nation of Islam, they used to go around calling white people the, the devil. But then, as it goes, for, goes on through the movie, we don't talk about, all about the whole film. What do we wind up seeing? Malcolm X winds up understanding the reality of his so-called prophet, his messenger. This man has been running through women. He realizes that this man that he's placed on this pedestal is nothing more than a mere man. Because his vices were women. And he had a bunch of kids that no one really knew about. Except for his other son, one of his older sons, Wallace D. Muhammad. And Wallace Dean Muhammad told Malcolm X, this is uh, what my father is doing. In other words, this man that you've been revering, this man that you've been giving your life to, the, this man you're ready to lay your life down for. This man is nothing more than just that, a man. And then Malcolm X saw this. And when he went and did his investigations, if you ever read the book, the FBI files, on Malcolm X, it tells you that the FBI were happy about what happened because Elijah Muhammad silenced Malcolm X, told him basically he couldn't speak, barred him from talking to anybody. If you ever go back and watch that movie, I Lee with Will Smith, you'll see that there was a part where he was close to Malcolm X. That was his man. That was his boy. That was his mate. As we like to say, they were down like four flats on a Cadillac, if you understand what that means. They were together, and now he can't talk to Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali. Can't talk to him because the nation said, this man is banned. So no conversation with him. So they block him out. And the FBI, they thought this was a wonderful thing, because it's in the book. They said, this, we thought it was a great thing because even Elijah Muhammad thought Malcolm X was going to break down and fall apart like everybody else had who got excommunicated. They thought he was going to fold. They thought he was going to just cave in and just <laughs> go into depression and fold. But they didn't know what kind of man they had created. Instead, he left the nation of Islam. Instead, he decided, I'm going to find out truth. He made Hajj. And he was told that in Mecca, the streets were made of paved the gold. And all the Muslims were doing all wonderful people. And they were all this, that, and the other. And he got there and saw the reality. There's no gold. These people aren't that great. In fact, they're quite arrogant. A lot of money and don't know what to do with it. But he also saw people from different nationalities that call themselves Muslim. He was sitting down in one of the tents with a white guy, a Turkish guy. He couldn't believe it. We drinking up the same cup. He drank and put it down. The guy just picked it up and drank behind him. He was like, oh my God. A white, people, a white person in America would never do that. From his, from his experience, you know, we're eating out the same uh, plate. Never experienced that before. 
He's with all these different people from all these different countries. And now he's able once again to see another truth of the diversity of Islam. He saw the truth of Hajj in which he's wearing ihram. And he's saying to, to the people as he's writing letters back home that for the first time I'm seeing everyone as equal. And that's one of the secrets of the ihram. Because when I made Hajj and everyone was in ihram and I'm walking and I'm, I was kind of standing off to the side and just looking and I'm seeing all these people in white. And it's like they say, you don't know who's rich. You don't know who's poor. You don't know who's educated. You don't know who's, who's not educated. You don't know anything. All you see is people in white and hands up and people worshiping and making dua and, and asking for forgiveness and asking for whatever it is they're asking for. But they're all in the state of worship. And this is something beautiful. And then I remember after, after Arafat was over and people had finished the Jamarat, you know, throwing the little stones, People started putting on their clothes again. And then when the people put on their regular clothes, I said to myself, wow, you could feel the difference. You could feel the arrogance with certain people because of the type of clothing they were wearing. You could feel the difference. A minute ago, it was all spiritual and it was all, oh, I had one of those moments. But then all of a sudden, it just went, you know, went, went, went. It was all gone because everybody started wearing their regular clothes and I started seeing the, re you, you could feel the people's reality. You could feel what people were like, how they felt about themselves. It was completely different. And even Malcolm X saw this very same thing when he made his hodge. It opened his eyes up and then he realized that no, white people are not our enemy. The white people aren't our enemy. It's just the issue, he said, and even the white man, he said, I feel sorry for the white man because many of them have to be schizophrenic. And I even read from uh, one lady, a sociologist, a European-American sociologist who wrote that many racist white people go through a state of schizophrenia. Because in the job, in the workplace, outside their home, they have to smile in the faces of people who are not white. But then when they go home, they got to let it all out and calling names and all these different things. And so for many of them, she said, it becomes a state of, of almost insanity because you have to play this game. Some don't, as we already know, but a lot do. In America, they say that the difference between the North and the South is that in the South, they let you know they don't like you. You're not wanted in this neighborhood. In the north, they just smile in your face. <laughs> hey, how you doing? All right, welcome to the neighborhood. Yeah, wonderful. Anything you need, we're here. Wonderful. Get home. Oh, my God, these Negroes are in the neighborhood. All oh, these Latinos, I don't know what we're going to do. Okay, these Muslims are here, and they're going to start tearing up the neighborhood. They're probably terrorists. You know, you get all these different things. We've got to watch them. You know, you come outside, stand, and get your newspaper, and someone's looking through the curtains. You know. This is what you feel. But at that time from Malcolm X, you began to see that, you know, this the issue of racism is a human problem and exists in everyone's society. And he felt as though that the only answer is Islam. When a person can throw away who they are and understand that the only thing that becomes important is the fact that you're Muslim, meaning that you're a servant of God meaning that you're a person that doesn't concern yourself with where a person comes from or what food they eat. All I can see is someone who's trying to become closer to God. All I can see is someone that's taking a journey, going through the, the cesspool of, of ignorance in this life, trying to find the oasis of Islam, the oasis of happiness with Allah. This is what he's trying, this is what he's seeing. And once a person can get to this particular state and this particular point, then wow, what kind of world would we live in when caste systems mean nothing? When I'm not looking at a, at a black face or a white face? Because don't, don't get me wrong, there are, people, there are racist black people in America as well. 
let a man catch you walking with a white woman. Or a black man, or a white man with a white woman. There are people who jump out and have all kinds of things to say in certain places. But the thing is that this is a reaction. This is a reaction to what has ba been basically the basis of the United States since black people were brought to that island, to that country. And it hasn't been easy. And it's not even easy now amongst Muslims. We go to some masjids in America where an African-American or a black woman who's been at this masjid and is predominantly Pakistani and Arab, and she's been there since the day it opened up. And she went to the masjid to say, look, I'm a little behind on my rent. I need some help. Please, can you give me some sadaqah? They tell her, you need to go to the black masjid. You need to be over there with your people. But I'm Muslim. And it's not like I'm some black chick off the street who just happened to know that Muslims give out money and threw a hijab on just to pretend I'm a Muslim to get the cash. I'm, I've been a part of this community since the day it opened up. I'm sorry. Our money is for the people of this community. I am a part of the community. That's what I'm telling you. You know what I mean. And she had to leave. We have situations in which Arabs have come and told many people, well, you know, you're not really Muslim because you don't speak Arabic. Or you're not really Muslim because, see, you, you know, you weren't born into Islam. You just converted. And they said, well, what about the Sahaba? They converted. All of them were convert, converts. Well, see, they were Arabs. They were Arabs. See, I was just, that's the best you can give me. They were Arabs. So there's become a divide. But then when things start happening in the Middle East, and then the black Muslims don't want to, you know, we're over here, see, we're black Muslims and our Islam is different. Then the Arabs are, wait a minute, you're just trying to distance yourself. We need to be unified. Wait a minute. We should, we, what happened? Unity? Now you want unity? You know, the, the people in the black communities have become Muslim and they've been reaching out and, and, and people have been coming to you guys wanting Islam and, you know, you don't even care if many of these people even become Muslim. You don't even care if these people become Muslim. They're asking you about Islam. They're crying for Islam. But you're not trying to give them Islam. And this was what opens up the door for pseudo groups like the Nation of Islam to step right in and say, look, black man, you don't need these Arabs. Come on with us. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is going to give you exactly what you need, brother. Now, I will say this. With the Nation of Islam, even though they are not on the correct aqidah, these guys have done more than the Orthodox Muslims. They have hospitals. They have schools. Whenever you see their men, they're always in nice suits and they're always clean cut and they, and they read. We don't read unless we have a class. And even then you may not read. You might get the little summaries. They, as a standard practice, have to read the newspaper every day. They have to know what's going on in the world. They have to read books. They have to go on a special diet. And when the, this issue in Ferguson happened, when the young man was shot by the police, First people to respond, Nation of Islam, pay for the legal fees, made sure they gave security to the family. Where were, where were the Muslims? The masjid, mashallah, subhanallah, oh, that was messed up. Uh, pass the ticket, please. We're raising money for other things going on over here. We got problems right here. So we, have a, we still have this divide because our, our vision, our perspective is not on the truth. And if we learn anything about Malcolm X is that he was a man who was about truth. And the truth is, is that we are all Muslim. We are not Pakistani. We are not Arabs. We are not blacks. We're not whites. We're not Malaysians, Indonesians. We're not Africans. We're not Indians. We're not Australians. We're not Aborigines. We are servants of God. 
And that transcends all things. For those of you who say you're Muslim and you believe, do you think on the day of judgment, God is going to ask you, so what did you do for your country? Were you a good Indian boy? Jamal, were you a good black man? What did you do for the black people? Is that what he's going to ask me? What did you do? Were you patriot? Were you a patriotic to, for, to America? Because that's where I put you. God is not going to ask me questions about my country or what I did for the people who share my color. He's going to ask me, what did I do in this life in terms of obedience and servitude to him? That's what we learn. If you remember in the movie, for those who did see at the end, everybody got these kids from all over the country. I am Malcolm X. Saying what? Saying that I have been awakened to the realities of this life. I have removed the falsehood and replaced it with truth. And with that truth came conviction. Because the one thing about Malcolm X, he was a man of conviction. One thing that was not in the movie was when he came here to the, United, uh, to the UK. And he was in Oxford. He was going to do a debate there. And the night before the debate, he was at this brother's house who was from, um, from um, well, he was one of, the, one of the Caribbean islands. I forget which one. But anyways, the guy was a well-known journalist at one point here in the UK. And they were sitting around talking and all these students and all these people came over to ask questions about the black movement and these different aspects of revolution in the United States. And, you know, just really intrigued to talk to this man. And there was people, black, white, all kind of people were there to listen to Malcolm X. So after it was over, the author of this text, he says, the book, I think, is called Ghosts in Our Shell. I think it's, no, that's a, an, an, an enemy. Uh, Ghosts in Our our something. I forgot. I'm sorry. I forgot the title of the text. Anyways, look it up. Look up books about Malcolm X. And in this particular book, he talks about how when everybody left, a very beautiful white woman came over to this, this Caribbean guy's house. And they were talking. And he said, well, I've got to go because I've got to take Malcolm X to his hotel. And she said, no, no, I'll take him. He was like, nah, uh, I know what your plan is. He's not that kind of man. She said, well, we'll see about that, right? Because she thought Malcolm X, he was attracted to him. Now, in the United States, everyone knows that uh, the white woman is the black man's kryptonite, all right? Black guys go weak for white women, all right? That's a fact. I don't have a problem saying it. I'm, I'm a black guy, right? I know. Anyways, so he gets in his car. He goes with this lady. When she comes back to the house, the guy asks her, so what happened? She was like, my God, I have never met a man like this before. I mean, he wouldn't even look at me. He wouldn't even touch me. He wouldn't do anything, anything I tried, any advances. He just shut it down. Man of principle. Man of conviction. For us, it doesn't matter if she's white or not. If you've got a woman and you're in a car alone, oh. She makes a couple of moves. You might say, oh, well, I was watching... I'll just make Toba later. You're going to do what you're going to do. We're human beings, right? But Malcolm X was a man of conviction. Again, because he understood the truth of the rea and the reality of this particular life that we live in. And this is an important thing for us. To make sure that we become, if we're not already, people of truth. Not falsehood. And we all have our own personal falsehoods. Our own personal falsehoods that we kind of project out to other people because we want to be looked at in a certain light. But we've got to destroy that. We've got to get rid of these idols that we've placed within our lives and become people of truth. I mean, to be honest, there's so much more. We could, we could talk about change when it comes to Malcolm X because he went through changes in his life. We can talk about Malcolm X, the academic. We can talk about Malcolm X, the revolutionary. We can talk about Malcolm X, the disciplinary. We can talk about so many aspects of Malcolm X. We cannot exhaust 
the different things and perspectives we can take from Malcolm X. But I ask you to go and read the story, watch the movie, whichever is easier for you, and learn about this man's transformation. And find your own story. Instead of listening to stories, become the story. You know, it's always nice to hear stories about awliya, nice to hear stories about sahaba, nice to hear stories about prophets, alayhim salam. But the question is, when do you become the story? When do you become the story? When do you become the example? I mean, you sisters are here in university. To me, that's very important. And it's even more important that you guys not look to get married too quick. Get your careers first. Because you know as well as I do, you get married, chances are there's a, there's a one in ten chance that you will not have to give up your job. Because you're going to become a housewife. So it's better for you to get your careers now, start you know, working hard, do your thing, then get married. Aren't you worth it? Aren't you worth the wait? Make these brothers wait. I'm serious. It's important. But why? Because I have four daughters of my own. They're looking at you. They need role models. Where's our Fatima today? Where's our Zainab today? Where's our Aisha of today? Our Khadijah of today? When my daughters are looking at you, I want them to see more than just nice fashion. I want them to see strong women. I want them to be able to see sisters that are paving the way, winning awards and, and, and breaking grounds in technology and in the social sciences. This is what they need to see. And when you sisters who return back to your respective countries who don't intend to stay here, the women back in your country need to see that too. They need to see women taking position. So that they can be inspired to say, you know what, there's more to it than just having babies and cleaning up the house and cooking food. Now, if that's your choice and that's what you want to do, that's different. But at least make it your choice. And you brothers at the same time, you too will be like me having daughters. What do you want for them? What do you wish for them to become? A housewife? When you look in the face of your daughter and she's smiling at you, all you can see, and I guarantee you, you will see nothing but potential. Are you just going to bottle it all up so she can just be content just being in the house with somebody? Depressed? Hurt? Her spiritual development has just gone completely out the door because there will be none? Because you made her get into some relationship she didn't want to be in in the first place. And yes, I'm, I'm stepping on sticky ground because this is some people's culture. But I don't care. Because things have to change. We're moving into a new era. And we've got to be cognizant of where we are and what we're doing. And open our hearts and minds to what? The truth. The truth is we had scholars. When the Prophet ﷺ married Khadijah uh, and, and he received revelation... He didn't walk up to his wife and say, baby, you know, you got to cut the job out. You know, it's making me look bad. You're making more money than me. Uh, you know, I know you got the business, but we're going to have to kind of put that away. You might have to sell it because, you know, I'm the, I'm the Rasul now. See, and this is, this is not working. This is not happening. You know, the brothers are talking. Right? He didn't do that. He allowed her to maintain who she was. She gave the money up on her own accord. She didn't say, yeah, and then he didn't come here and say, look, woman, give up that money. Start giving some charity around here. I'm the Rasul, you're making me look bad. I'm talking about charity and you're not giving charity. What's up? He didn't do that. When she gave, she gave from her heart. When she gave up everything, it was from her heart. It was from what she wanted to do because of her love for Allah and the belief in the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So why should we be any different in allowing our women to grow and to thrive and to give when they're ready to give? 
and to be the best because that's Islam. As we strive for greatness and perfection, they also have to as well. This is a team effort. When we get married, it's a partnership. We're both presidents. And this is how we should approach everything. You know, when you're here in, in the ISOC, when you need programs, you need to get some things run, who do you go to to get the flyers? Sisters. Comes time for set up, who's there to set up? Sisters. For Eid, who, who makes sure all the food is laid out and everything's in place? Sisters. So we need them. It's a partnership. As we grow, as we take our journeys, as we begin to discover the truth of who and what we are and where we are, we begin to make and build a better ummah. And not just the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the ummah of the world a world community and people get a chance to really see what Islam is and not what it isn't as one of my teachers said everyone knows about Islam but people haven't really seen Islam yet and I, I, and I say we still haven't seen Islam we haven't even seen Islam so it's time for us to make that change we should be making dua that Allah removes the veil and allows us to see the reality of this life to see our reality, to fill our hearts with truth and devotion and certainty, conviction. If we learn nothing else from this particular talk, it's this, these last few things. Truth, conviction, certainty, love, devotion. <coughs> Because that's what made Malcolm X, Malcolm X. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of you. Protect your hearts. Make all of you firm. May Allah continue to allow you to grow. Allow you to nurture what he's already given you. Recognize what he's given you. And take what he's given you. And allow it to grow within you and around you, that when people see you, they're just affected by your very presence. And they're filled with love, they're filled with admiration, they're filled with happiness by your very presence. And again, this is my first time in Sheffield, may it not be the last, but if it is, may Allah bless us all to gather in paradise. And may we have another meeting where I'm not the one leading the talk, but we're all sharing stories of how we became the story that the people on earth are still talking about. That have been written in the books by the angels. That the angels are even conversing about. May we sit and talk about how we chose to entertain truth and do away with falsehood. يا رحم الراحمين يا رحم الراحمين يا رحم الراحمين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you all again.